We've come to Germany to visit a wind tunnel to see how the latest carbon wheels are being designed to be as aerodynamic as possible. Now we're going to learn how bike brands actually use wind tunnels to design their wheels, but also how the understanding of aerodynamics has evolved over the last few years and what separates the best wheels from the rest. This is the tunnel, and the brand that's giving us access today is Reynolds. A big thanks to them for making this video possible. Now, most cycling brands don't own their own wind tunnel. What they tend to do is buy time in a tunnel, and that's exactly what's happening here today in the GST tunnel. Reynolds are testing some of their latest wheels, including this one, which is a, a Black Label 80. Shh, it's not actually been released yet. Uh, you saw it here first. To find out what that involves, we're going to talk to Todd Tanner. Todd is the Director of Wheel Development at Reynolds with over 30 years experience in the bike industry. He's also an ex-professional downhill mountain biker. Thanks for inviting us to the wind tunnel, Todd. The first thing I want to ask you is what information does the wind tunnel give you and how, how do you use it in the development of a wheel? Yeah, so in our development process, the wind tunnel is kind of like the final check and balance for our development. We use it to validate the data that we've um, accumulated through CFD and real world testing. And then we also use it to uh, use it as benchmark data in the future as we develop new mo wheels moving on from what we currently have. Even if we have data on our old wheels, we'll bring them in again and reproduce that data as we test the new wheels to check against to make sure that um, we have the best correlation between old versus new. When aero wheels first started to be a thing, the way that brands would develop them would be to typically make several prototypes of different profiles they thought would be fast, and then take them to a wind tunnel to see if they were. Now, this is very similar to how aeroplanes were first designed aerodynamically in the 1950s and and 60s using wind tunnels before the advent of computer modeling and CFD. But as that's become more accessible, bike and wheel brands have used that too, to the extent that now they tend to develop their products using CFD because those tools are now so powerful and then take it to the wind tunnel to see how it performs in the real world compared to virtual reality. You don't have to mold a rim yeah. or 3D print a rim and bring it to the wind tunnel and then make adjustments on site or go back and come back again to the wind tunnel. We can sit and in a space of a month run thousands of profile variations. And so it allows us to really fine tune the profile to achieve the aerodynamic characteristics we're looking for. The wheel is one of the very few parts of the bike that sees clean air. And the aerodynamic performance of a wheel largely is on the frontal area of the tire and the rim. Um, but we do look at how it affects uh, the flow going into a complete bike. And if, it, if we can make any improvements or any adjustments in our rim design that will improve a bike's performance as well. During the development of the first aero wheels, they typically tested them at naught degrees yaw, head on. It was a logical thing to do. And they also used existing profiles that were known to science. So the NACA profiles developed by NASA, and that led to the classic V-shaped cross-section rim. Now, while these did have very low drag at naught degrees yaw, they weren't especially good in crosswinds. And we learned that, well, wind very rarely comes from head on when you're riding in the real world. So we do a lot of work with our profiles uh, with some I would say unique to us measurements that allow us to increase the stability by varying where how the wind interacts with the center point of the wheel um, and as the wheel system and that affects the stability when it comes to on bike performance and so our profiles we use the profile shape to modify and manipulate where the pressure reacts on the on the wheel system and how that affects the stability of a wheel whether we want to make it more stable um, to the point where it's harder to initiate a turn stable or we want to have it 
a low, a low side force wheel, but still very nimble and reactive to rider inputs. Stability is really important, but as our understanding has developed, we've learned that other things are super important too, such as the rotational drag within the wheel itself and the width of the wheel tire interface. Well, for overall aerodynamic performance in relation to drag figures, you want the, the air to stay attached to the rim surface and then reattach as it leaves the rim as quickly as possible. So a lot of our work in uh, the overall width and the radius of the sidewall is about keeping the wind attached and then reattaching it after it leaves the rim. Where we position um, some of the dimensions on our rim and how the shape changes over the course of the sidewall and at the trailing edge is what we use to modify either lower the side force or change the pressure of the wheel and how it affects the handling. The culmination of all that research and development is a profile like the one I'm riding now. But as good as CFD and wind tunnels are, real world testing outdoors remains super important and is the final step. The reason for this is that, well, sudden gusts of wind are really hard to replicate in a wind tunnel. And anyone that's ridden outside with deep wheels will know what I mean when I say it can be really unsettling when you get a sudden gust of wind and it throws you off. But those little twitches aren't just unsettling, they're also hugely detrimental to performance. And that's something that we've learned from real world testing outdoors and telemetry. So when you typically feel those little twitches of the wheel stalling and becoming unstable, if you're racing along, you typically soft pedal subconsciously for a moment, just back off the power, just to try and regain control. Or if you're in an aero position, you typically do something like this and come out of the aero position. And all those little incidents add up a frightening amount over the course of a time trial if you're running wheels that are really unstable to the extent that, well, it's easily the difference between winning or losing. If you look at some of the old Reynolds aero designs, we had a very sharp spoke face, our DET1 um, rim profile design, and it was more of a true aerofoil, and it was specific to really low side force loads. With our new DET2 profile, which you see here in our Black Label Road product, we've changed the radius of the sidewall significantly, and that was directly in relation to manipulating how the center of pressure on the wheel adapts in different wind conditions. And our profiles are different for the different depths because we want that center pressure to react differently. And so in the case of the 46, we have a very wide rim with a larger radius on the sidewall, but then we change the radius as it gets closer to the spoke face. The evolution of rim profiles went originally from those V-shaped rings we spoke about, then to U-shaped toroidal rims, and then it's culminated in things that we have like this, this DET2 profile, which well, is considerably wider at the wheel tire interface for wider tires, but then it has an interesting shape, which bulges out a bit like a U-shaped profile, but then it has a clear defined edge, which then tapers off into almost like a V, but not quite. And this type of profile is said to be far superior in terms of aerodynamic stability. The idea being that by having a wheel that is more stable, you can run a deeper wheel than you would ordinarily. And what's that worth? Well, roughly speaking, it varies, but roughly speaking, you're looking at around for every 10 millimeters of increased wheel depth, one to two watts saved, but it all adds up. Yeah, as we've worked with our REM profiles and our DET, profiles over the years, we've created a, the ability to measure center of pressure on the wheel. Um, we have a, a pretty complex system for measuring that that's proprietary to us, and that's kind of our secret weapon when our, in our rim <laughs> design. But we'll use that in the CFD to, to design a rim to handle a certain way and react a certain way in side loads, and then we'll validate it with real world riding. And each of our rims, in the given different profile depths are tailored differently for their riding purpose. The intended characteristics we want for a 80 is, are not the same as a 46. So what's the riding purpose of an 80? Speed, right? Yeah. Triathlons, uh, 
lead breakaways, solo adventures where your where your key metric is aerodynamic performance. Um, that's what we want to achieve in the 80. We want pure aerodynamic speed, but we don't want it at the sacrifice of stability. Our wheels are always very balanced between low drag figures and really good crosswind stability. When choosing a wheel depth that's right for you, it's also worth factoring in your size and weight because lighter riders tend to get blown around a bit more than heavier riders and consequently often prefer and feel more stable on slightly shallower wheels. But other details that are worth knowing about are things such as well, internal nipples, which are technological developments, and also very narrow, thin-bladed spokes. You'll notice that modern wheels have much narrower spokes than uh, wheels from 20 years ago. And that's because these make a difference for the rotational drag of the wheel. So you have typically two types of aerodynamic drag on a wheel. You have translational drag, which is the air coming and hitting the wheel from, from motion. And then you have the motion within the wheel itself, which is the air swirling around a bit like a, a whisk. Now, having those small little details like the spokes and the internal nipples reduces that rotational drag ever so slightly. It's a marginal gain, you're talking fractions of watts, but when you're spending a lot of your hard-earned money on some expensive wheels, it's worth knowing the differences that can set out wheel A from wheel B. It's worth pointing out that typically 15% of your aerodynamic drag comes from the bike and 8% is the wheel and the vast majority comes from you the rider and so there's always going to be people out there who go oh wheel stability or being 30 seconds quicker in a 40 kilometer time trial i'm not bothered about that i just want to go and ride my bike and if that's what you what you think then well i'd say yeah this this isn't this isn't for you you know aerodynamic wheels don't bother with them but just understand that there are plenty of people out there who performance does really matter for and well I'm one of them. What impact does the tyre have on the overall the Tires system? have a huge impact, right? But that's one variable that we can't control. A rider is going to select the tyre that they want to ride. What we do is we optimise our wheels to work with what we feel is the most relevant tyre size range. For example, all of our new wheels are optimised for 28 and 30 mil tyres. But what a consumer chooses as far as the type of tire or the tread pattern or the rolling resistance in the tire, that's up to them. And they can run bigger or smaller and there will be an aerodynamic impact, but we try and minimize the tire's involvement in that and fine tune it for the contemporary widths that people are using. What is the aerodynamic impact of say running a 25, a 28 and a 30 as, as you guys have measured it on, on these wheels? So all of our wheels, whether it's an 80 or down to our 25 have a 21 mil internal channel. And that allows us to really focus our performance on the 28 and 30 mil tires. If a rider goes, but between those, we try and reduce the impact of the tires um, effect on aerodynamic performance. So between a 28 and a 30 on our, on our new product, you're roughly looking at maybe a two watt impact at the most. Um, you're going outside of that and it's gonna be more or less uh, depending on the tire size, but for the for the optimized tires, it's a very low impact between the two. Well, yeah, it's been fascinating. Thanks so much for for having us along to see the the testing, what you're doing, and um, yeah, thanks absolutely. Very much. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Todd. Well, there you have it. I, I found that absolutely fascinating, and I can't imagine now what wheel shapes are going to look like ten years from now, such as the evolution that we've had from say twenty years to this point. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments section below. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, if you've got any. I'm gonna go now and um, get, it's really, really cold in here. That's why I'm wearing my coat. <laughs> so I'm gonna go warm up and have some kartoffel salat. Auf Wiedersehen. Well, you get down, here.